Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the In the Numbers podcast. I am your host, Jarvis Hall, director of the East Metro STEAM Partnership out in East Multnomah County in Oregon. We are excited to be here today. We have a, a double double guest, so, so we're, we're, we're double dipping, as they say. You know, it's, it's, it's frowned upon in the world of uh, chicken nuggets, uh, chicken wings, you know, and uh, chips and dip. But here in the numbers, we don't mind uh, double dipping a little bit. The number of today is 30 million, which is a pretty big number. I know some of you are like, man, 30 million. How could that be the number of the day? Well, it is 30 million because that is the number of acres of forest land that we have here in Oregon. 30 million, over half the state is forest. So if you're walking down the block, if you walk one block and there's no forest, in theory, the next block should be a forest. Uh, to give you an idea of how much forest we have here in Oregon. And to talk more about forestry, we are going to bring in our special guests. We have Sarah Nelson and Amanda Astor of the Associated Oregon Loggers. Everybody give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Let's switch this over to the gallery view so everyone can see you all. Great. Thank you both for being here today. Sarah has the cool uh, logging background, so that's fantastic in the, in the back, so we can see some of those. Uh, Amanda wanted, wanted to go blurry. She didn't want everybody to see the cool background, but that's all right. How are both of you doing today? I would love to hear everything you're saying, Sarah, <laughs> and I'm sure it sounds fantastic, except for you being on mute. Other than you being it's on fabulous. mute, it sounded great. We're doing great. Thank you for having us, Jervis. This is very exciting to be here on your podcast to talk today about what we're doing. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, we're excited to be here. I'm, I'm thankful you both are here. Uh, you know, I grew up in the city, so I didn't know as, as much cool logging things were going on until I heard about uh, Oregon, uh, Associated Oregon Loggers. And I was like, man, they're doing some really cool stuff. And young people can get, get involved in some of these things that are available. There's some conferences, there's scholarships, there's internships. I was like, man, this is really cool. Why am I not here most of it? And a lot of times, uh, a lot of folks, uh, you know, what, we, what they call the city folk, you know, my family's from the South, so they call us city folk, uh, don't always hear about the other cool opportunities we have in Oregon. Uh, but first, let me start with, uh, with you, Sarah. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and tell folks about your role uh, a little bit in, uh, in AOL. You know, no, not you got mail, AOL. Uh, I, I know that, uh, that threw me off when I started a little bit too. So <laughs> I am the Workforce Development Manager here at Associated Oregon Loggers. I was given this opportunity to come and help really shape the future of how people get to be working in forest related careers. And Associated Loggers represents forest operators and contractors, which are everything from road builders to loggers to site management to reforestation. There's a lot of different types of folks that work with Associated Loggers and it is, um, like many industries, really trying to figure out how to connect to current and uh, future workforce. So my background has very little to do with forest specifically, but has a lot to do with uh, career pathways, workforce development, economic development, um, engagement in CTE programming. So I was given this opportunity. Um, I also have a human resources, so just kind of the, the people side of things. And so between a passion for education and an interest for getting people to work, I was given this really exciting opportunity to hopefully make a difference for our, for a pretty important industry in Oregon, actually. Well, that's fantastic. It's always cool to make a difference. I, 
two, what I say is I'm a recovering HR professional. Uh, I used to do HR a little earlier in my career, so I, you know, say I'm say I'm, say I'm, re- I'm still in recovery uh, from from being a, an HR person, but understand the economic development world, and um, it's really cool uh, that you get to do some of this work and help uh, engage into the 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 next generation of of foresters. Uh, Amanda, you like to you know, introduce yourself a little bit and kind of tell folks what you do and kind of a little bit about how you got here. Well, what made you choose this 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 realm well i am associated oregon loggers forest policy manager uh so here at associated oregon loggers i uh, do lobby work i work on monitoring the activities of our federal and state partners uh, and land management agencies so u.s forest service the bureau of land management and also the Oregon Department of Forestry, uh, working on their uh, rules and regulations, uh, and then also doing just general advocacy work for this industry and and for our members. Uh, I'm a certified forester with the Society of American Foresters uh, and have degrees in this field of study. So together, uh, me and Sarah create a very uh, dynamic duo in this space. Uh, so it's been really great to, to work with her and her expertise in the workforce development and career pathways field, um, since that is not my specific background. Although uh, my first job, my first career job in this space uh, was a pathways job uh, with the Society of American Foresters working for the U.S. Forest Service as a pathways intern. So uh, when we can create those pathways, uh, get young people into the into the field and um, uh, starting their career on a good leg, it's always going to be uh, beneficial and keep them uh, working in this in this field as well. Because I know I uh, really appreciated that opportunity, and it gave me a lot of future opportunities as well. So it's funny. Uh, whenever I do opportunities like this, I always like to say uh, I've been hugging trees for a very long time, um, ever since I was a kid. Uh, How I got engaged in this specific field of study is uh, had a, um, went on a backpacking trip when I was a kid. I was also a city slicker, if you will, out in Minnesota uh, growing up and didn't know anything about the woods, but always loved collecting uh, toads and salamanders. I was the kid that ate dirt. Um, That was me. But I didn't know anything about this career field. So I went on a backpacking trip, um, my first ever, and uh, fell in love with the woods and started looking at uh, what type of jobs would bring me uh, into the woods and um, engaging with the natural world. So uh, that's sort of where I fell in love with the woods was uh, back when I was around around 10, uh, peeling birch bark to start fires because of the oils in the bark. Um, picking strawberries out on trails. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Great. So I see, you know, that's what brought you into the woods. I think that's, you know, some of those things what kept me from the woods. You know, back when I was younger, you know, Friday the 13th was out and, and, and you know, the, the, the Jason movies were out and those always happened in the woods. And so I was always like, I don't, don't want to go in the woods. You know, those they never, they never came to my, to you know, to the hood or to the, the city. I think the, the, the first one that kind of came to the city was like Leprechaun. I don't know if you remember the, the, the Leprechaun series of, of movies. It was that and Candyman. Like those were the ones I was scared of. But like the woods, I was like, no, that, Jason's out there, Freddie is out there, no. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. I think uh, uh, one thing that I that I learned about. Uh, you know, more recently than I'd like to admit is, is how much, not only just how much of our land in Oregon is forestry land, but how much of that land is actually uh, uh, owned and are managed by the federal government. And so uh, that's one thing that was uh, interesting to me, especially a lot of our our land in, in, in Southern Oregon and, and Eastern Oregon. I'm like, man, there's a lot of this territory that's actually federally managed and um, it, it's often forestry is a, for people who are interested in forestry, um, you know, 
the the federal route, like like you talked about with with the 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 federal internship program, is often a pathway. Can 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 you talk to a little bit? Uh, either Sarah, or Amanda, whichever one wants to jump in, uh, talk to kind of the federal partnerships and kind of the federal uh, 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 the federal involvement that that is in the, the logging area, either for your work that you're doing or for the work of the members, because AOL is a is a member organization. Uh, so I'm afraid for your for your members, or how do you see that those those, those federal partnerships going on? Yeah, I can start off and then Sarah, if you have anything to add, I'd be uh, happy to turn it over to you. Um, so there's sort of two uh, general camps of jobs I'll, I'll talk about. So there's the more career forester uh, where either you have gotten an associates in forestry or a four-year degree path. Um, so that's more the college route would be your technical expert a forester practicing what we call silviculture, which is kind of like a, a forest and tree doctor. So uh, what a silviculturalist does is they look at the current condition of a forest and uh, write a prescription. Uh, that's right. They write a prescription um, on how to get the forest from the current state to the desired condition or the future state uh, of the forest that is um, where we're trying to go. So that's more of the degree, or degree path. And so if you work for uh, the federal agencies that work in land management, that's typically the pathway you would go, would be the college route. Uh, the other kind of uh, group of workers are those that we represent at AOL. Uh, so those would be the forest contractors, uh, the folks that just want to get going in their career, uh, maybe have an entrepreneurial um, uh, bone in their body that they want to they wanna flex and strengthen. And uh, that would be those folks that maybe uh, don't want to go to college, don't want the student debt, just want to start working. And again, those are the folks that we represent. So um, those are also the folks that work and get the job done of that civil culturalist. So you need both. You really need both. And honestly, right now, we are not in a shortage um, by, by many uh, stretches of the imagine for foresters. There's a lot of people that think the only way to be successful is to go to college and go that route. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, we have a lot of members that are very, very successful uh, with the, the career path that doesn't lead you to college and just gets you right in the field. Um, and there's a huge need out there, out there. So there's a lot of opportunity, especially when we start looking at uh, the wildfire risk that we have. Oregon has a lot of wildfires and there's a ton of uh, federal and state money coming down the pipeline uh, to get more of that work done. So there's just huge opportunities to get engaged in the contract side. Uh, so with that, I will uh, let Sarah chat about some of the things that we may be working on uh, on that route. So I know, Jarvez, this does not necessarily directly answer um, about the federal government owned land necessarily, because I believe that we're, we might have some of those contracts, but the state run lands um, and other privately owned land is where a lot of our folks do most of their work. And hopefully Amanda will nod some sort of agreement with that. Um, but the forest contracts and contractors and operators, harvesters, while they do wildfire abatement, they do replanting. Um, and we do tend to work with um, that second group, like Amanda was saying, um, as far as work with federal sort of touch points, uh, we are working specifically with Lane County because they have a sector strategy on wood products and we're working with them on a federal grant for, for uh, supporting training and expansion. Um, we're working with different ways to engage with educators, potentially educator externships or teachers in the woods type programs through different partnerships around the state that could offer an opportunity for educators to build lesson plans around jobs in the forest, be that the checking the health of the trees and, and harvesting as well as um, getting into understanding the landscape to then do harvesting operations to 
build landscapes like you see in the picture behind me and um, to sort wood there's a lot of wood sorting like they'll they'll say okay well this is an x type y type going to this type of thing they'll go on the ground these machine operators will pick up different logs and stack them and then those particular stacks of logs will go to one purchaser and so there's a lot of kind of work on the ground with understanding um trees and where they go it's not just axes and saws in the in the forest and cutting stuff down there's a lot of um interesting work uh, a lot of our folks have small businesses a lot of them are one to 15 people um they're small shops they do um like interesting work i think in regard to wildfire abatement and yeah i think that's all i have to say right now okay that sounds fantastic i'm actually going to come back and uh, ask a little follow-up for, for both of you on that. Uh, but first, we have to take a quick break to do a sponsor read that today's episode of In the Numbers podcast is sponsored by the East Metro STEAM Partnership. Uh, the East Metro STEAM Partnership has uh, opened up a student investment challenge for 2021 2022 school year. And we're asking students, how would you invest $100,000? We're using the site Market Watch and allowing students to invest $100,000 into a virtual stock market game. Uh, winners will see a variety of prizes. You must be at least 13 years old and attend school district, uh, attend school in, in Park Rose, David Douglas Centennial. Gresham Barlow, Reynolds, Corbett, R. Monoma ESD school districts uh, to be eligible for the prizes. Feel free to go to our website at eastmetrosteam.org. That's eastmetrosteam.org to check out more information. I recommend this game to one of your students. And we are back here uh, with Sarah and Amanda from Associated Oregon Loggers. Uh, you went through a, a lot of information, which I thought was fantastic. And it actually uh, leads into one of the things I wanted to speak about. I think there's some, uh, there tends to be hesitancy uh, for folks uh, when they think about logging our, our forestry as a, as a career path. Uh, some just see it as cutting down trees. So they, they, they look at Sarah's background and say, see, all Sarah wants us to do is go through the forest and cut down all the trees. And, 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 and Oregon's not going to have any more forest if I become a logger, because I'm going to be super logger and, and cut down all the trees. And uh, that, I, you know, from, from my experience, is not exactly what, A, what forestry uh, is about, forest management as well as the careers in logging aren't necessarily that. And the work that you all do, uh, both with, within the organization AOL, uh, but in what, uh, what your members uh, uh, are about, is, you know, to me, it sounds like the, and it's always sounded like, you know, the, the forest is a livelihood, is a, a living, breathing thing. A lot of people who actually care about the environment are actually in, in forestry. What would you say to those that, that might fear that a career path uh, in, in logging is just cutting down all the trees? I will make a point because um, I have a lot of family members who, who, who are adamant. Um, they care a lot about the environment. And obviously I think actually everybody who's out in the woods um, does have a level of care for the environment um, or they wouldn't actually be out there. Um, they there's a sort of some interesting things that I've learned since I started here at Associated Loggers about um, kind of what you're speaking to about the hesitation that people might experience when they think about uh, what is logging. Well, one of the things that Associated Loggers does is we are a sustainable forestry certified qualifier agency, which means we the majority of our members come through and they are required to take um, what's called, and it's run state by state. It's, uh, there's a North American overarching agency called uh, Sustainable Forestry Institute. And that covers um, 
all of the provinces in Canada and all the states that do logging operations in the United States, which is about 36. Each state runs different programs that uh, certify or qualify the forest contractors to be uh, qualified to do sustainable forestry. Um, and it covers a lot of the laws and regulations that create a pathway for sustainable forestry. And I know that I keep saying that word, but that's basically the bottom line is that it does provide a structure and framework for folks to understand when they are harvesting trees, what are the rules around road building that doesn't do damage to streams? How far away, like what are the size of the logs and what's the density of logs that have to be left in regard to the distance to a stream? Or what is the environment that has to be left for different types of habitat? What kind of habitat live in the area? And how do you navigate a proper and sustainable harvesting practices to then keep Oregon green? Like when you said that the 30, mil 30 million acres of forestry, Oregon, and Amanda told me this, we have more trees than we did 100 years ago. And um, sustainable, responsible forestry management protects us from huge wildfires. And, and part of what's happened with the, um, the way that stuff has been managed, the type of underbrush that has grown has provided fuel for massive wildfires, which we've all witnessed in the last two years that have been record-breakingly huge. And with proper uh, prescribed pre-burning with underbrush um, management and certain types of selective uh, logging, those things are actually reduced. And this has been um, shown on demonstration lands. It's been shown in other parts of the country where, where they do more prescribed burning. Amanda knows a lot more of the science of that, so I might actually hand it over to her. But for people who care about the environment, um, like the sustainable forestry qualification that all of our majority of our members go through provides them the ability to properly harvest for the protection of waters and environment and species protection. And actually, Oregon has the first and one of the most stringent uh, forest practices requirements that's mandated across the board for all harvest operations, large or small. And because of that, and because it was implemented in the 70s, um, we've had some of the most innovative, I guess is uh, innovative. We were a very, in, we're an environmentally innovative state. It's why we have free beaches that are open to everyone. It's why we have the bottle bill. The Forest Practices Act is in line with all that stuff. And it was an initiative by industry, by landowners, by government. And it was this collaborative thing that went, got together and built protection because if you take all of the environment away, there's no jobs, there's no air, there's no good water. So there's a, a lot of compelling reasons why, although um, I think that, I feel like this was the best kept secret that I knew nothing about before I started here. Um, it's something that has really led to my level of confidence that we're doing the right stuff in responsible and appropriate harvesting. So I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna hand it over to Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That was a lot of uh, really, really great information. Uh, one thing that I would say um, is that although when you're driving on a road, um, say the highway, say I, um, the interstate, and you look and you see uh, a clear cut on the side of the road, uh, what you don't see from your car is all of the baby trees that have been planted in that clear cut. And um, you may not recognize that um, although trees that are tall and, um, and, and large uh, provide habitat for a certain amount of wildlife species, that young forest, which we call early seral, uh, also provides habitat to different species. And so when we have a diversity of age classes uh, throughout the state, throughout the forested environment, we're actually um, benefiting the most wildlife and um, what we call ecosystem services. So clean air, clean water, um, economic products uh, like wood for your house. 
uh, paper for your schoolwork, things like that. Um, we need to have that diversity across the state in our forests. And one thing to, to remember, or one thing I hope that you can take away from this is that in Oregon and in uh, every state in the United States, we harvest less than we grow. So when Sarah is talking about sustainability, at its core, sustainable forest management means that you're not taking away more than you're putting into the system. So the amount of forest that we have continues to grow. The amount of trees that we have in the state continues to grow because we're never removing more than we're growing. The problem that we have right now is not logging. It's not the amount of logging that we're doing or harvesting that we're doing. It's wildfire. The wildfire issue that we have in the state um, is removing forests from production. Uh, that's reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and uh, photosynthesis that the trees are uh, undergoing. And in certain areas in the state, uh, Jarvez, you talked about the fact that about 50% of the state is uh, managed by, of the forest land in the state is managed by the federal agencies. Well, uh, the majority of that uh, 50%, uh, about 80 to 90% uh, is in what we call reserves. And those reserves typically do not allow for uh, salvage harvesting a removing of that dead wood, getting back the economic value to then pay for reforestation. And so, for instance, when you're sitting in uh, a place like Eugene or in Portland and you drive to Bend and you see old fires that still have dead trees with very young, if maybe no, understory, uh, that's because those were uh, wilderness or those were in other reserves that were not able to be uh, reforested. And so it, when we log, we are required, not that we wouldn't, but we are required to reforest those acres under the Forest Practices Act. So just know that when you see a clear cut or you see some forest management from, uh, from your car on the highway, um, what you can't see is all the little baby trees in the nursery that really exists up there. No, oh, thank you for that. And I, you, 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 I, I think for some reason, I, I think here's what I think is what happened, what's happened. I think because I wrote down some of my, my show notes and questions, on paper, you all being connected with the Associated Oregon Loggers could actually read what was on my paper. So you knew what stuff to kind of pre-answer uh, beforehand, kind of like one of those Harry Potter deals that, you know, if it's written on paper, you're able to see it. Uh, because I was, that my actual next question was really gonna be about uh, the forest fires and how uh, it impacted uh, the, the the logging industry and and you all I know we uh, over in East County because of the, uh, the 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 wildfires that got all the way up to to Troutdale and and things like that it was uh, it was really something uh, for let me let me step back for our area we've always had a, a an interesting relationship for an urban area uh, with forest fires. Uh, because of our Troutdale Airport is a, a place that the Forestry Service always often used for their planes and helicopters. And so, uh, but I think this this past uh, uh, wildfire season, well, before that, uh, when we really start to see, uh, hey, we have, you know, I'm, you know, folks in Portland, you know, we're seeing ash, you know, covering their cars and things like that. And to be able to walk outside and and kids are like you know why is it smell like that or why does it look like that you know folks are used to acid rain maybe in in LA or or things like that they weren't they're like what what what's this like we've never seen this and we have to say hey that's the result of forest fires have those kind of impacts what have you uh, anything else you could speak of to to how those have impacted 
you know, either the logging industry, business owners, uh, the forests, uh, you know, any other uh, things to, to share folks just, you know, I know it's easy to, you know, have Smokey the Bear out and say, you know, forest fires are bad, you know, but um, I like folks to kind of see or, or feel and hear what some of those impacts are that, that folks are still dealing with today. Yeah, I can take that, Sarah. Um, so uh, actually, this is a very timely question because uh, recently the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, which is a state uh, organization, uh, actually completed, they contracted out a economic impact study for the 2020 uh, Labor Day wildfires. Uh, and in their report, there's a full report um, from the contractor, which was uh, Mason Bruce and Gerard, that was the lead contractor, uh, and they're a forest contra contracting uh, organization uh, with, with a large reach across the world, actually, but they have a contingency here in Oregon. Um, and then... Uh, and as you're and speaking then, that, I'm showing the, uh, the economic report so folks can see what it looks like visually. You can take a look at it, it's available uh, online over at uh, OregonForest.org. You can find yep. that information there, but go ahead and keep talking. Yeah, and so and then so uh, Jarvez on the screen is showing the full report, um, but the Oregon Forest Resources Institute actually did a summary report as well. That's only 16 pages. So if you want to have uh, the opportunity to, to get a little bit more um, of a summary view, I would suggest reading that uh, specific document rather than uh, the full report. If you really want to dig down, uh, you can you can go there. But there was over uh, thirty billion dollars in just standing green timber um, that was lost in that fi those firestorms, um, and that's just one piece of the devastation. In in uh, for for Associated Oregon loggers, the uh, estimates that we produced, I want to say, um, want to say we're in around the three hundred million uh, dollar range as far as losses to the forest contracting sector. Um, that may be incorrect. I'm just going from the hip here. I don't have it in front of me. Um, but we lost a lot of uh, equipment. Uh, we lost a lot of uh, work. So for instance, if you are a logger and you are out there doing your thing, you've done your road maintenance to be able to get access into the woods, you've started to remove the timber, um, and then a wildfire comes. Well, all that cost and time that you put into that work will not get paid for because you did not finish the job, if that makes sense. So this is a production industry. Um, and so all of that plus idle time, not being able to be out in the woods during the fires, um, shutdowns, we have safety protocols. So when there's bad uh, extreme fire conditions, even when there isn't fire on the ground, uh, we do not work in the woods. So um, we, we try to reduce our uh, likelihood of causing a fire. Uh, so we, we don't work. So that's kind of idle time. So there's all these things that add up for the contractor, but then the industry in total. And so, um, you know, now we're dealing with big issues with reforestation and the cost of reforestation, not having enough crews, not having enough seedlings. Um, and so the, the impacts uh, economically and just for forest health are uh, pretty bad. So that's why this past legislative session um, in, in 2022, AOL was heavily engaged in passing a big wildfire omnibus package in the state, um, $200 million to fund sort of a proof of concept because the cost to, to get our forests and our communities um, to be in adaptive states to be able to uh, re respond and be resilient to wildfires, because wildfires aren't going away. We, we need to be able to live with them uh, but we want to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. Um, and uh, so this, this bill package is hopefully going to be a proof of concept to um, get, get our communities in a better place, uh, help provide some grant funding to get more work done on the ground. 
Um, but this is something we're, we're going to have to deal with for a long time. So with that said, uh, I will uh, put the plug in to say there's plenty of work out there to come into this field. We'd love to have you. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah if you have anything else that you want to add on uh, the fires and any economic uh, impacts. Yeah, I think that between this, this between the omnibus bill that Amanda spoke about and opportunities for, um, I learned since I started here that a lot of our forest operators um, are heavily involved with fire abatement and it makes sense. I mean, it's it's a livelihood that involves them, but many of them are out there on crews um, fighting the wildfires because they, they are requirements for any time you're out in the woods to have a basic fire, like your ax, your shovels, your, you know, they there's just a, a very intuitive and both both trained and intuitive understanding of how to navigate in the woods. They might be a first, they might be someone who sees an initial fire and call it in to the to the fire department or to the um somebody if they're out working in a on a landing and they're like, that's smoke that shouldn't be there. Um, they may be a they may be a first both first responder to put it out so that it doesn't become something large or catastrophic, um, but they also might be somebody who's just on the front lines fighting it. And so, other than there, like Amanda's plug, that there's a lot of work, and we definitely want more people to consider um, the understanding of kind of the whole industry and scope of the field. There's heavy equipment operators that are clearing lines. There's truck drivers that are carrying water out, there's fire watchers on many of the sites. So, um, or on every single one of the sites, a lot of times in some seasons, it's a requirement. Um, so there's a lot of work that's done that's not necessarily acknowledged as a, um, as a part of the job. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of, it's a very interesting uh, opportunity, I think. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, that I think one one thing that's really really interesting that I that I thought about as as both of you were talking was uh, thinking about uh, like I said when you think about logging and forest management and those things holistically because uh, it's 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 more than just cutting down a tree you know you have uh, Amanda talked about the the tree the tree doctors. So to speak, I kept thinking I've been uh, there's a um, they kind of did a remake of, of Doogie Howser MD on Disney Plus is like Doogie Kamealoa, which is which is interesting. I'm like, man, imagine you know, I was thinking of like, uh, do you ever watch the show House? You know, it was like this surly doctor, like imagine like House, but it was like a tree doctor. That's what I was thinking, like this this surly person that just comes in like. We can't figure out this tree. We gotta, we gotta save it. And like they, they bring in this, this house to come in to, to diagnose the tree and, and save it. Part of me is thinking about that, but just to think how much goes into just that the, the idea of forest management, you know, with, with of course, of course, the feds and, and those type of things. Uh, Amanda's work uh, legislatively, making sure you know just what things are supported and where where funding is going and. Uh, because we we definitely saw that it's an issue that impacts all of us. We we've seen the news with California and people kind of evacuating the houses and folks are like, well, they shouldn't have lived in the woods, or they they should have evacuated when they're supposed to. But then you see how quick it's, hey, this is maybe a fire, and then bam, it's a wildfire that's engulfing, you know, thousands and, and thousands of acres. Uh, that that happens very quickly. And, and uh, to be able to see the amount of folks to be involved where you could have a career in the field. You could be a lawyer and be doing uh, uh, forestry law. They need folks in the weather service, scientists and stuff, and meteorologists thinking about that, uh, folks dealing with the soil. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to hope Amanda stays away from some of the more soil cuisine uh, things that she was uh, into when she was a little bit younger. I don't want you on an episode of... Uh, uh, what was that? Uh, one of those TLC shows where you know people have uh, things. So, so we'll we'll stay away from the from the edible dirt cuisine for right now. 
I'm staying away from the culinary prowess, but uh, that is interesting. Some of those other points there and who's all involved. And I didn't even understand the stuff about the, uh, what would you call it? The under brush under something. Well, what was that term? Uh, early seral habitat. Yes, yeah, trees. I don't even know, sir. That sounds like my yeah. like my uncle from Louisiana was named Searle or or something like that. Like Searle, where did Searle come into this? Uh, uh, but all those terms sound really cool, and it's interesting that uh, you know when people think of environmental science, they don't always see environmental science and logging. They're like logging, well, that's not that's like anti-environmental science, but it's actually the environmental scientists that allow uh, logging to be done properly and sustainably. And uh, we're gonna jump on to something else here really quickly. I wanna make sure we do our, uh, our final sponsor read of the episode that again, today's episode is sponsored by the East Metro STEAM Partnership. The East Metro STEAM Partnership is hosting a student investment challenge. Asking students, how would you invest $100,000? There's an opportunity for students in the East Metro region. That includes school districts of Park Rose, David Douglas, Centennial, Gresham Barlow, Reynolds, Corbett, and Multnomah ESD. The opportunity to learn about investing and get experience uh, putting together a portfolio and managing it throughout the school year. For more information on this, visit our website at eastmetrosteam.org. That is eastmetrosteam.org. We are back here with uh, Sarah Nelson and Amanda Astor of uh, Associated Oregon Loggers. We have to switch the conversation because now we have to talk about one of my favorite pieces of the work that you all do is your uh that you're a part of is the Oregon Logging Conference, which we are, I believe, if I if I'm reading the counter right on the website, we are within 100 days from the Oregon Logging Conference, which is going to be held uh, on uh from uh Thursday to Saturday, February 24th through the 26th, uh, 2022, at the Lane County Convention Center in Fairgrounds down in Eugene, Oregon, with the headquarter hotel being the graduate, uh, the graduate Eugene. Uh, I will start with uh, Sarah. Did you talk a little bit about the, uh, the conference a bit? There's some really cool things there. I'm a, I, I, I don't want to, you know, say too much before you say something but once i learned about the conference i had heard of it and i saw it and and i want to go because it just sounds like the coolest thing in the world but uh say so, talk to us a little bit about the about the conference so i also have not yet attended but i have talked to their coordinate their lead coordinating folks down there and they have some extremely cool opportunities for the future forestry workers day where they will have um, demonstrations, which are basically like something you mentioned earlier that I that I think um, I'm hoping that I can engage more schools with is setting up what's called timber sports, um, which is choker setting, cable and line splicing, cross cutting, power bucking, log rolling, and log scaling. Now I know you're like the what, but these are all skills that you know. That's um, exactly what I was doing. When you were saying <laughs> that I'm like. One, I don't know what they are, but I want to do them, uh, especially because, you know, as a, as a kid who grew up on uh, ESPN, you know, I used to watch the, the strongman competitions, and there was always this guy, this Magnus for Magnuson was like this really cool dude they would always have where they would flip the, uh, they would flip the logs, and that was the first thing I thought of. I'm like, hey, if there's a log flipping one, I need to go there. Uh but 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 so, but you talk a little bit about because a lot of folks don't know exactly what you're saying when you said those. So if you could so, share a um, little bit about what they are. So a lot of these are the skills that are involved in 
sort of timber and harvesting and, and forest operator specific skills. It's, um, I sent you a link to um, steel the saw maker. Um, is, yeah, as we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna share the screen so our, okay. our video folks can, can see some of this. Our, uh, our audio folks, uh, you won't be able to, but if you go okay. to steel, uh, S-T-I-H-L, the, the company steel, if you go to steelusa.com slash steel, dash timber sports you'll see a very cool home page that like i said it looks so cool that i want uh to do it this looks fantastic so and i recently learned that this is on the list for things that could be an olympic sport um because i learned that the year that it the last time this olympics were in australia it was timber sports or uh sailing and I guess sailing one, but so they apparently it's been on in a major consideration for um, for actual Olympic sports, which to me gives it a certain amount of uh, legitimacy as a sport, not just a activity. Um, but these are high school students competing in the arena of timber sports, which is the cutting and uh, binding logs, which would be very much like what somebody would do in the field. Um, they also are going to do, uh, there's going to be a sponsored competition between a forest operating harvester and a high school student on a, on a simulated equipment where they're basically competing on a virtual landing for a harvest operation, which I think is pretty exciting because a lot of times um, there's some pretty innovative learning opportunities for folks to, a lot of logging equipment is uh, industry specific, like yarders and pillar bunchers and very specific grappling and the types of equipment that like the log thing that if you're on the video, you can see behind me, like those are all picked up by different pieces of uh, industry specific equipment. And so there's the ability to learn these is now in a pretty cool simulator space. So that is a thing that we are working with to get more folks to get that training so that our companies can say, yeah, a lot of the work is in heavy equipment operating. And um, historically, somebody would spend the first chunk of their career on the ground and work their way into a machine. But there's a lot more mechanized forestry and logging. So there's definitely a need for folks who are excited about working in the field as a heavy equipment operator or something of that type. And so I think it's kind of cool that at the Oregon Logging Conference, there will be a competition between uh, one of the students and uh, somebody who actually does the work. Um, and I know that there are opportunities for schools to get together buses and they will be, there's a sponsorship through OPRI to bus folks down. And so I'm really, really hoping Jarvez that we can work together to get some excitement, to get some folks to this event. Um, so. Yeah, so I, one, I will say folks definitely check out OregonLoggingConference.com has a lot of the information about the conference. It sounds really cool. I know, uh, and that's one thing I think for, for our schools would be something, uh, yes, definitely we want to see that, you know, if there are interested students in schools, uh, we can, you know, see about getting buses to get folks down to the, the conference. Uh, I think the uh, kind of these, uh, the, these high school sports, I think might be a really cool way uh, what I know there there might be some apprehension from some teachers would would be just around the equipment piece and how to access those things and and uh you know if they never did any of these things it's harder for them to coach so like you know if I play football I can coach the football team if I play basketball I can, you know coach the basketball we're we're working on having gaming teams and that's been the biggest resistance to to having video gaming teams is that some teachers like, well, hey, I don't know anything about video games. How can I, you know, coach the team? Uh, if I don't even know what the, uh, what is, what is this called? If, if I don't even know what, uh, what choker setting or uh, cable line splicing or power buck. Now for the record, I don't know what power buck is. 
but I want to do it because it sounds cool. I, like I said, some of this stuff, I don't know what it is, but that's one thing I'll give it to the, the logging sports about is they sound really cool. Like, I don't know. What yeah, no, these, these folks are stuff. like the, yeah. the strong man. It's close to Powerball. I don't know, but I want to do that. Whatever that is, uh, sign me up. I know some folks, you know, I've gotten more interested kind of in a pop culture way uh, because a lot of folks are, you know, going to some of these uh, either uh, restaurants or, 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 you know, establishments and doing the, uh, the, the axe throws. That's been, a timber sport. That's actually, uh, have been, have that came out of Timber pretty popular. Sport, for sure. Without uh, a doubt. Now, but that's, yeah, I, I saw that. that I like, everybody huh. thinks they're four. Uh, but other <laughs> other than that, like, you know, people throw one axe and all of a sudden, you know, they're, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, do all <laughs> of No, you, you just threw one axe. Like, calm down. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's kind of introduced some folk to some things. And so, what would you say to uh, some some teachers who might be like, hey, we, you know, I have an interest. Maybe I want to, you know, include some curriculum. Maybe I'm, you know, thinking about this conference a bit. And maybe, you know, what, what, what would you say to that person who may, uh, to that teacher? A lot of our our audience are, are teachers who have, uh, who may, uh, who may, be curious, but they don't quite know like where to take the next step or, or how to go about there, doing that. It's it's a great opportunity for learning. I know that when I first talked to the coordinator at the, who runs and sort of was part of the building the, that future forestry career day, it's, they have it so well organized. You don't have to know anything about it to learn a ton. And they have a very organized rotation of activities for students. And I want to say back before COVID hit, they had almost 2000 students that they bust in from everywhere from Southwest Washington, all over the state. And there are some fantastic opportunities to go with your students and learn a little bit about what the work is or what the STEM, STEAM, and CTE opportunities are and what's the map that goes into it. What about somebody who wants a real career that who might not be college bound, who is willing to work in maybe eventually for themselves and get in on a crew that gets to work outdoors, which is kind of a cool opportunity and a space where it's, you know, it, it can be physically demanding, but some of the heavy equipment operating jobs are, are maybe not. Um, and they there's so much to learn and so many different types of things. There's a list of, you know, 30, 60, 50 different jobs that I've gotten and I'm making different pathways and which ones are you know, a lateral move, which one there's a step up, and I'm still kind of trying to digest all of this so that I can bring it back to folks like yourself and say, here's some opportunities for folks who want to get started. And, and you know, it's a living wage job that's um, really, really interested in getting more folks into it. Okay, so you just want teachers just to just call you and so, um, they can uh, sign up to go to the conference. I know there's um, opportunities to get buses down. Um, I'm happy to be a resource. You can give my my number and my email, and I'll answer as many as I can. And if I mean, I'm I'm not in charge of the buses, but I am happy to connect them with the folks that are. And um, so, yeah, I'm definitely happy to be a resource. Because I, I I know, uh, I do know that you know, of course, they're going to listen to this podcast because you know, I mean. Who doesn't listen to this podcast? And uh, you know, we're 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 going big. We're global. We're international. I think we have like one download internationally. So you know, we're international now. You know, just like they say, any airport that has like one international stop at like an international airport. Uh, so we know this is going all over the world. Then folks are gonna get on. They're gonna go to organloggers.org, and uh, they're gonna check out your all's website, and they're gonna be like. This is cool. They're gonna to go to Oregon Logging Conference, and they're like, "This is cool. I want to get involved. I want our, our students to be involved." Uh, they don't know how yet, and uh, they're probably gonna look up uh, Sarah and Amanda and say, "Hey, they were cool on the podcast, so I need to oh. I need to reach out to them." So there's a CTE club overview of the Future Natural Resource Leadership Group, and I know that that is a sanctioned school CT 
ESO or something, there's a particular sanction that uh, the future, future natural resources leadership is a club, is a recognized club that like apparently took a bit of a dip and now there's, uh, it's the third largest in the state, like FFA might be number one, the future forester or future farmers. And then there's something else. And then there's the future natural resources. That's a really good place if there's a group of students that are like, interested and passionate and don't know, don't know where else to go. That's another opportunity and resource for um, uh, instructors to engage for that. That's not just the logging conference, but this is a great way to get in touch with what kind of opportunities might be for students in general. Okay, and is that the, the FNRL? Yeah. The future? Natural resource leaders. Future natural resource leaders. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll make sure that that is uh, is out there for folks. So feel free to we'll make sure that information is on uh, our website. And I think the 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 biggest thing we want to make sure is that we're we're starting conversations. You know, we're letting folks know that 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 logging jobs are out there. I do appreciate as somebody who's a big proponent of entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, we have from our, our area, we tend to have a lot, we have a lot of, of poverty per capita. So we have the, the smallest uh, uh, of the STEM hub area of, of the state. We have the smallest geographical area, but we have the most poverty per capita. Uh, and one way that I believe in that is by providing pathways, not just to, to jobs and living wages, but also pathways to ownership, whether that's, you know, folks being able to own their homes, uh, but being able to own businesses and to be able to 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 be on that uh, to have that as a pathway as well, uh, if that's something that they so choose. There's some people who don't want to own business, they're like, "Hey, I want to come in, I want to go to work, and I want to come home." That is fantastic. There's some people who love the 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 fact of being their own boss, being an entrepreneur, being able to, you know, maybe uh, you know, feast or famine. So you know, one month you might bring home a dollar. The next month, you might bring home hundred thousand dollars. You know, there, there's folks who don't mind that that ambiguity, and and we want to make sure that our young people have those options as well. We want to make sure uh, we have a, a lot of diverse folks in East County, and we want to make sure a lot of diverse students have opportunities uh, in in logging and forestry uh, as as well. And so sometimes when it's outside of the city, some folks think, that, oh, that's not a city person there can't be into that well you know we got amanda here and she's like i was from the city and i loved it and i'm hanging out in the in, in the forest and uh you know we have, i appreciate both of you is there any kind of last things you want to say to uh to you know either students who might be watching this thinking about a career path to teachers uh who may be the people who actually introduce this uh field kind of to their students or people who might be starting a business and think, hey, I, maybe I want to get into the logging business. Anything that kind of last word you want to want to share with folks, I'll, I'll go uh, Amanda first and then Sarah and then. Yeah, great, thank you. So uh, a few other things I want to add about the Oregon Logging Conference as somebody who's been many times and volunteered in many capacities as a speaker and for the future forestry days, um, your day. I've volunteered for that program and um, for another educational program for fourth and fifth graders. Not sure if there's any younger teacher, you know, um, teachers that teach younger kids that listen to your podcast, but um, the I will speak from experience that the Future Forestry Careers Day is fantastic. Many of AOL's members go. Uh, you typically will be able to uh, see a, a wildland firefighter truck uh, there, uh, watch a video related to firefighting, um, as well as be able to get and climb into a piece of heavy equipment. Um, it won't be on, uh, but you'll get to be in it and see what it's like, see how big the tires are. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and there'll be lots of booths for teachers to, to learn more and to uh, collaborate and uh, coordinate and, and learn from other organizations um, uh, for that definitely reach out to the Oregon Logging Conference. And then the bus systems are done through the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Um, and so you can coordinate with them or reach out to us 
uh, to, to get those specific contacts um, if that's easier. Uh, and then, like I said, there's also a fourth and fifth grade uh, educational opportunity, uh, again, with free busing from Oregon Forest Resource Institute, and that's run by the Forest, uh, Forest Today and Forever. I'm on their board, uh, and they are a forestry education um, uh, organization in Lane County that puts on that program uh, with help from um, Forest Today, or with help from um, Talk About Trees which is an organization run by Oregon Women in Timber, um, of, of which I've all, I'm also a member of. And um, so if, if you do have uh, other friends who are teachers who teach younger kids, there's opportunities for them as well at the Oregon Logging Conference with, in addition, the younger kids actually get part of their uh, field trip is that they get a uh, tour of the actual conference grounds uh, where they get to see a ton of different types of equipment uh, you've got big uh, bulldozers and things where the kids always like to get inside the uh, the buckets and take a big picture of their class or their uh, tour, which is really, really fun. Um, so all of that. And then one last thing I want to add for you guys, um, and hopefully I'm not stealing Sarah's thunder here, uh, but there's also a video contest uh, by an organization called Through the Trees. Uh, that is specifically for high school aged uh, uh, students 14 to 18. Uh, they can uh, research a specific topic uh, in forestry and then uh, de develop a video. Uh, and the grand prize is actually $1,000. And if you're a teacher and have a student that participates, you will be entered into a raffle drawing as well. Um, so we put a little bit of an incentive in there for the teachers, if you can engage your students. Uh, and again, there's uh, other prizes as well, just the grand prize is $1,000, uh, which, is, which is great for those that um, are looking to uh, get engaged in, in a new topic. Uh, there's a whole rubric and scoring rubric on online, um, and we will provide that uh, for you guys as well. So the... Um, Entries are accepted between September 1st, uh, so you can already submit right as of right now, and they will go through April 15th of 2022, uh, and winners will be announced May 1st of 2022. So uh, we'll get more of that information to Jarvez, and so you guys can all see that as well to provide additional opportunities for your, uh, for your students. No, no problem. And for our video folks, because I am a video, I'm a visual learner, you can go right to through T H R U the trees.org and it's right on the homepage. You go through the trees.org, boom, forest careers video contest for students. And so we're going to definitely make sure this information gets out on our end. And we may even provide some incentives to some teachers in East County if they have some of their students uh, involved in this contest. So uh, they can click right on here. For those on audio, that is www.thru.thetrees through the trees.org. And thank you for that, Amanda. Appreciate you being here, Sarah. Did you have something you wanted to, to follow up there? And I'm, I'm sure Amanda stole everything you're going to say. <laughs> uh, but if there's anything else you want to drop in, uh, um, go right ahead. I just want to say thank you so much for giving us the time to be here and chat with you and to get out to the in the numbers and um I mean I I have a I have a little one pager that I made about kind of interesting facts on on uh the, our the work that we do that I might just send you in case you want to put something about us um but I think that this is really exciting I think there's a lot of jobs I think people overlook it a lot because of whatever various reasons we like don't they don't see themselves there and I think that that is something that we want to change like it's okay to see there's a lot of opportunities that are pr probably different than you might have that than people think of actually like I know that I've learned a ton since I got here and we want to work with you we want to help you and um, if teachers have questions I've gotten cold calls from um 
cold calls from instructors that are um, in small towns where they're doing CTE and forestry and they're interested in how to talk about the sustainability piece. And so we're talking about, you know, as we're updating our curriculum um, to share with folks to make sure that they're aligned with how to properly and um, sustainably forest, that that gets out there so that uh, young folks can start thinking about that and, and being more aware of the career opportunities. So. Thank you again. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate both of you being here. I definitely appreciate all the resources. Um, and I appreciate if you letting folks know that that uh, that logging careers are, are more than just cutting down trees. And that's what I really wanted to, to make sure people understood. And uh, I wanna give, uh, let's make sure we give Sarah uh, Nelson and Amanda Astor a big round of applause. Thank you again for joining us here at the In The Numbers podcast. Remember our number today was 30 million, the 30 million acres of, of, of forestry land that is here in Oregon. Uh, Thank you. And Amanda letting us know you can hug a tree and it's okay. It's quite all right. You can be great. And thank you all so much for being with us. We'll give another last round of applause for Sarah and Amanda. And as we head out, uh, make sure you take a few moments to enjoy the nice uh, weather that we might be having. Uh, enjoy a tree where you, where you see it and make sure that you stay in the numbers. Thank you so very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.